you, Jonathan. Thanks very much, Sarah, and thank you very much for uh, having me here today. I've, um, I came in at the beginning, it was amazing to hear the ambassador, I was really inspired. I had to duck out halfway through, uh, which here in the last panel, um, it struck me just as I was listening that what we need more than anything right now is a bit of hope. And, and thank you uh, so much, Bruce. Where is Bruce? Where are you? Have you ducked out? He's left. But um, it's, it's great to hear Bruce. I always feel encouraged at hearing him. Um, I feel like we're at a moment of opportunity uh, here. Things are changing. Things are breaking down. And while there is a lot of pain involved in that and a lot of uncertainty and the risks and the threats are incredibly high, it also means that it's a moment of opportunity share the frustration of CND. You know, the Green political movement shares its roots very much with CND in the fight for disarmament. We are pro-peace at our core. We are unapologetically and unwaveringly opposed to nuclear weaponry. We have been since our conception. But sometimes it's very hard to look around and see that hope, see how things are going to change. But you know what? I think people are realising that the system is no longer working. For the first time, we have an entire generation who are going to be worse off than uh, the generation that's gone before, and people are realising that. Uh, there is uh, unrest um, emerging in no uncertain terms. We heard uh, mentioned just now by Ray the anti-fracking protests, and we're seeing right around the country dissent, uh, people rising up, people in all sorts of different areas uh, opposing deportation flights, for example, the Stansted 15, uh, who have just been convicted under anti-terror laws. Uh, potentially to life imprisonment for stopping a deportation flight. But what they did was right, because people had a chance to appeal on that flight and stay in the country. They are uh, our moral conscience, and we stand on their shoulders now. Uh, we can see Extinction Rebellion fighting climate change, and people are also starting to make the links uh, between the nuclear industry, uh, between nuclear weapons, as we just heard, with climate change, as Bruce made that link beautifully, and with the economic system, as you heard, with the military-industrial complex and the big vested interests, the dots are starting to be joined, and people seeing that the system isn't working, and that we need something new and something alternative. So I'm excited. I worked in the House of Commons in the early 1990s, and this is a story I tell quite often, but it gives me hope. And one of my heroes then was a backbencher, a Labour backbencher called Tony Benn. The older <laughs> members here will remember him well. Like him or loathe him, he was a bit of a Marmite politician. He divided opinion. You had to respect his 50 years working at the political coalface. And when he retired, he said, I'm leaving the House of Commons to concentrate on politics. <laughs> I'm leaving the House of Commons to concentrate on politics. And it's his conviction that it was movements that changed things, these big seismic shifts. And around that time, I got a letter about 1995 across my desk uh, from an academic um, from a Scottish university, said, I've got this great idea. Why don't, in the year 2000, we cancel uh, some of the debts of the most indebted nations in the world? And I have to confess, I nearly fell off my chair laughing, thinking, this is never going to happen. No one is talking about this. No political party was talking about it. Five years later, the G8 was sitting around saying not can we cancel debt in the developing world, but discussing which countries' debts they were going to cancel. And it started to happen in a very small way, and it's still a long way to go, but it started to happen. In those five years, the agenda changed seismically because of a movement, what Tony Benn talked about, movements changing. The whole political agenda was changed because of unions coming together uh, with campaign groups, with aid agencies, with church groups. And they had a big ring round, I think it was a G8 in Birmingham, 60,000 people went around the city and they joined hands. MPs were getting pound coins delivered to their offices, I remember, in Westminster. Uh, people writing in saying, use this pound to cancel some of the debt in the developing world. <laughs> and the MPs had all these pound coins on the desk going, I don't know what to do with these. And they were raising the issue. They were changing the agenda. And I think we're starting to see, uh, because of the lie of austerity, uh, because of the hardship of austerity, uh, we're also starting to see the big infrastructure projects starting to be questioned. We've seen even HS2, £56 billion on a high-speed rail link that will cut off 20 minutes from a journey from Birmingham to London is starting to be questioned. The folly of HS2, £56 billion, and that's about a quarter of what it costs to renew Trident. Colossal eye-watering sums of money. But now that's starting to be questioned. We see Hinkley, nuclear power, £36 billion it will cost on Hinkley, a reactor four other versions of which have never worked anywhere else in the world, locking us into a deal for years to come 
uh, at a strike price for the energy that it will produce that is already far in excess of offshore wind and onshore wind, which is now onshore wind the cheapest form of energy. And people are starting to say, well, why? Why are we spending 36 billion pounds? Why is 36 billion pounds being spent on Hinkley C when it's going to take years to come online? It's already five years behind schedule. The model of reactor doesn't work. It's a more expensive deal. It's owned by foreign interests. It does not make sense. And people are starting to say, well, hang on. Particularly academics at Sussex University who are now giving evidence to parliamentary committees saying, you know why it is. It's because this is a subsidy, an indirect subsidy for the renewal of Trident. Because when we use the expertise, they are transferable. And it's nuclear weapons that is driving this ridiculous, absurd deal, which by any measure should not be going ahead. And people are starting to make the links. And so I see hope. I see hope in the future. And I also think the hope will come from unexpected places. Um, I unfortunately missed the session. I think we, we, we covered US women, did we, earlier? Um, and, of course, going back to Re Rebecca, who is here, uh, a Green Party member who is at Greenham Common. You know, many of those uh, women there were on the front line, and we stand on their shoulders today. And the same way they push the agenda, I think we will see that opposition come from very unexpected places. But they will be strong voices, they will be loud voices, and they will be voices that change the agenda. So, friends, I'm hopeful about the future. I'm hopeful about what we can achieve. I'm hopeful that as we speak truth to power, as we expose what's going on, we can see seismic change. And if we've learned anything about the last three years and all the uncertainty, is that you never know what's round the corner. If we'd been sitting here three years ago, how many of us would have predicted Brexit? How many of us would have predicted Trump in the White House? How many would have predicted the surge towards Jeremy Corbyn? How many would have predicted the green surge in 2015? How many would have predicted the massive presence of the SNP in Parliament under an unjust electoral system? We're seeing these seismic political changes, seismic things which five years ago would have just been unthinkable. No one would have laid any money on them at all, but they are starting to happen. And friends, I believe we can win this, and I believe it will come sooner rather than later. Thank you. I would like to talk about Act Local mm -hmm. um, because thinking about the number of membership for the Green Party, number of total membership for CND is far bigger than my group, the number of uh, membership of SOAS CND society, which has nominally around 600 in the mailing list. But normally it is around from five people to 20 people, depending on the events. And good or bad, students come and go every year. So even though we have very active uh, members, students, they graduate in three, four years later. But it means, at the same time, we every year have new people. And uh, some of them are really politically active and motivated. Problem is, maybe, if we do not recruit them, they will restart to be, uh, we, they will be active in other campaigning and other uh, societies. And uh, let me uh, talk about specifically, um, uh, first, I am not young. Now I am 49 years old. This year, I will become 50. But I am still here in school as a student because I want to do something, something more. And I have got involved with CND's campaigning, Stop the Wars campaigning, and together with some of my friends, I have set up Japanese Against Nuclear UK, a small Japanese group in UK to oppose specifically against nuclear power after Fukushima nuclear accident. 
I would like to do anything I want to do, anything I can do. But because of this, sometimes I feel depressed with a very small capability of myself. It is really limited, and I often uh, get beaten by the tough reality. But yet, at the same time, I can find that there are so big possibilities. Um, after bikini test by the US in 1950s, only 20 women in Suginami Ward in Tokyo started campaigning for the petition against nuclear weapons. And it overwhelmed Japan, and it ended up to get 20 million petitions in Japan. Almost one-fifth of total population of Japan, Japanese people signed it. There is that kind of momentum. After I came to this country, UK, I saw the big surge of demonstration when US, together with the UK and Japan, started to attack Iraq. It was described as UK's biggest, historically biggest political demonstration. But it was also the biggest demonstration I have ever experienced, and it gave me dream, hope, possibility for the future that we can change the society by our own hands when, if we stand together. And uh, one of the new students this academic year, year has got involved in Japan already with Gen Suikin, which is equivalent to UK's CND. CND started in the UK in 1958, so last year was 60 years old for CND. Gen Suikin is three years old, three years older than CND. It started in 1955, two years after Godzilla, the first premier of um, nuclear monster Godzilla, was screened in Japan. It was the period that many nuclear tests have been taken, but yet many people in Japan in those days felt that it didn't have anything to do with us. So it is clear that when momentum comes, people make an action, but it is at the same time it is really important to begin the campaigning even before we see momentum. That's what I have experienced through my own experience. And in terms of game seeking, um, that male student have already got involved with Genseiking movement and helped Genseiking to translate uh, their documents into English, and uh, they, he uh, came to join CND UK's annual general conference last year. And another student came from Okinawa, Japan, which has US bases and have been suffered from it for many years. And in terms of nuclear weapons, now it has been revealed that US has freely brought nuclear weapons with nuclear submarine to Okinawa with the secret pact with the Prime Minister Sato uh, already. 30, 40 years ago. But it was revealed only last year that there was such a secret pact between US and Japan. This student, female student from Okinawa, has been so angry about this situation and why this is not known by other people, especially 
the people in mainland in Japan. And she is now a member of SOAS CND Society. And we have some students. One has already got involved with Labour Party activity. One CND activity in his um, sixth form school days and one with Green Party activity. And they are now members of SOA CND Society. Unfortunately, none of them are here today. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, what I wanted to say is, uh, this one is uh, uh, our new program, reading group of Best Again, the manga uh, written by, drawn by uh, Hiroshima survivor, uh, Keiji Nakazawa, who died, unfortunately, three years ago. Uh, but uh, one of the students, actually he has already graduated, so ex-student, but uh, kept getting involved with our society uh, action, uh, just started this activity, weekly uh, reading group, from Monday next week. And this one is proposed by one of the postgraduate uh, students uh, who is already a writer and a military analyst uh, who uh, once studied in North Korea. And actually, he is a supporter of nuclear weapons in North Korea. Okay, so uh, I disagree with uh, his idea on that case. But yet, um, we decided to have public meeting like this. And also, um, together with our friends, with Jan UK and Kik Nuclear, uh, again, we will have three events in March. One video in front of Japanese embassy on the very day, 11th of March, when Japan was hit by earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear accident. And then demonstration later on Saturday 16th of March from Japanese embassy to the parliament, and then having rally in front of the parliament. And then parliamentary public meeting. And also uh, because one of the mother has proposed it, we will have one more event, the tw Wednesday 20th of March, the public meeting with mothers from Fukushima here in SOAS. Like this, as be just because I'm here, um, not a few people asked me to work together to have meetings, events, and uh, I am quite sure the same thing will be, should be applied to everybody. We should know someone who wants to do something. So, thank you for all of you to be here. And uh, let's continue to work uh, this uh, potential uh, activity, which is uh, open to the future. And when you have a chance to talk to youngsters, students, don't hesitate to talk about this political uh, issue. They, maybe not all of them, but some of them are waiting to get involved. Thank you very much. Thank you to all our speakers, we've heard some great things. Uh, the things that really stuck out to me was the importance of not just harnessing this mass movement that seems to be uh, kind of emerging and which keeps emerging in this sort of, you know, dying down bit and then coming back in a new form. Not just harnessing that, but making sure that we're campaigning that our message is clear all the time so that if there is a new group that rises that we have a plan and some clear options and some ways to get involved with things. You also heard, which really uh, resonates with me, about trying to utilise your own skill set. We all have different ways that we can be useful to this movement. 
So really trying to about where we fit within this and what you can do. And of course, political education, the importance of that. I, um, I went to Barrow and Furness uh, recently and I spent a week there. And uh, during that week, I discovered that uh, academies have a system whereby a local company can sponsor an academy. I didn't know about this. And uh, as probably most people in the room know, Barrow and Furness is where the AE systems seem to own most of the city and they, uh, you know, everywhere you go, all you see is the BAE systems logo and you can't mm. see the sea because there's just massive warehouses and you walk over this bridge and you can actually see one of the vanguard sub submarines as it's being kind of worked on in the dock and it's just very frightening there. You can't take your camera out because there's people coming over and questioning you all the time. It's, uh, you know, it's very kind of scary or intimidating place to be in. And when I found out that this company is sponsoring the local school, well, I had a little look on various websites, and I found that uh, BAE Systems are actually producing student resources to give to schools. And one of the student uh, papers that was in these teacher education packs was aimed at 9 and 10 year olds. And the question was, in the space below, draw uh, your design for an underwater secret killing machine. Oh, you know, BAE Systems is currently planning on trying to expand its monopoly or sponsorship of these schools to include primary schools now. So I guess what I'm saying through this is, is that we, you know, we need to be active in political education because the others are already doing it. Those who have got uh, investment and profit in continuing this continuous war. I'm going to open up the questions now. Uh, uh, and uh, I'll pick three and let the speakers respond. Hi. Hi. Yeah, um, <coughs> your, point, your point about education and the role of education and all of this, I think um, from my general point is that we kind of neglect too long that we look at like how to solve kind of all these issues that we spoke about today, we need to be educated, we need to come to things like this and kind of have these discussions, but I feel like so off, so little do we reverse the arrow and point education to war, uh, well, yeah, education to war, and actually look at the way through the education system, like you were saying, and through the curriculum, especially like we look at the last five years, or since 2010 more specifically, like how bad curriculum's got in terms of who controls it. I feel like we do, I feel like, I, don't know, I feel like there's got to be long-term consequences of that in terms of, you know, in terms of schools and how people actually perceive these issues. And like the, the role of a teacher and the capacity of a teacher to kind of discuss these issues in a classroom. I mean, uh, if you're discussing things like World War II, for example, uh, I'm pretty sure a teacher in a school, if they started talking about disarmament and stuff, you know, they're going to be looked at um, not following the curriculum and you know, kind of stepping outside the discourse. So I think it would be interesting to hear, especially from Jonathan, in a polit uh, political aspect, like. What can we do to change curriculum, to change the discourse in education, in schools, more specifically? Um, yeah, I think that's a question. Thanks. Um, could, could you explain, and it sounds like a very obvious question, but why are the nuclear trident, etc., why are they so expensive? And who audits where all this money goes? Because it seems, you know, to me, it can't be that expensive. Hmm? <laughs> so I was going to make two points, but the gentleman over there has made a really good point about political education. And again, there is a push, and I've seen in the history classroom, um, that we don't really talk about disarmament. We talk about how each country was trying to progress, and that they developed and they became a better country by introducing nuclear infrastructure. And we don't see it as actually we're bringing more war, and that we're ending peacetime by introducing nuclear weapons and this generation is being taught that nuclear weapons is the way forward and this is how our country progresses. So my first question was going to be, I think he's made a very good point, how can we persuade young people that disarmament is the way forward and it's the way that will bring peace? My second question was, I mean Jonathan made a very good point, um, that we can make impacts on uh, second world and third world countries by just making little steps. Do you think, or what do you think Britain could or should do to try to persuade other countries 
to veer away from pushing towards nuclear weapons because lots of countries like like India and Pakistan yeah. and the and the like are pushing towards nuclear weapons. But is there any way? And what do you think Britain should do to push forward against the expansion of nuclear programs across the world? Thank you. I'm going to let the speakers respond and then I'll take some more questions. Can I just briefly say that I think you should be the next Prime Minister? <laughs> <laughs> What's your name? Sean. Sean. Great name. Mm -hmm. Who wants to begin? Uh, yeah, um, I just, I'll give my hand. I'll, I'll come to your point because it's a different joke to me. Um, I mean, in terms of other countries, I think we've got to lead by example. Yes. I, I, um, you know, you can't sign up to a non-proliferation treaty and then when you try it, you know, it, it's absurd. We have to show moral leadership. And invest, in, for example, in using renewables. You know, we've seen this government cut and cut and cut and cut the subsidies for renewables, um, you know, off Onshore wind doesn't really need them any longer. Um, it's become you know, the cheapest form. But the solar feed-in tariffs were cut and it pulled the rug from under a, a, a flourishing solar industry. Now, we could be exporting that technology around the world, making it cheaper, exporting that expertise, benefiting the world, showing leadership, rather than you know, investing in nuclear power, so, um, which subsidised the, the weapons. So it is very much leading by example, would be my, my short question. Just to answer to the question. On education, I think this is so crucial. That we have an education system that's geared up towards creating economic units to compete in a global marketplace. It's a system that's dominated by testing and a culture of league tables, which is destroying our children. It's damaging our children. We have a mental health crisis. Um, it's a one-size-fits-all education system that doesn't, isn't child-centred. Uh, it's, you know, to have children, young boys of five or six cross-legged on the floor in a primary school, that's just totally against their nature. They should be running around, exploring. You know, you start formal education in other countries in the world at seven and everyone catches up and they flourish and they get that developmental um, progress made. So we've got to completely rethink education. So we've seen, as you say, the curriculum narrow, this big emphasis on the sciences, on maths, rather than this flourishing. You know, education needs to be about allowing our young people to discover who they are, to flourish, to be child-centered, to allow them to explore and ask the questions. And we've got such a rapidly changing world. We don't have to fill our children's heads with facts all the time. We, can, we need to equip them with the tools to navigate a rapidly changing world that is changing at such an exponential rate that unless we equip them, they will just sink in, in, this, in this world that's changing so fast. So we do need to, to totally rethink education. Behind the education system, as you say, there are these dominant narratives. Um, the myth of redemptive violence is, is the one. You know, this idea that violence is redemptive. It's in lots of our literature, but it's within the way World War II is taught, it's the way war is, is taught in schools. Um, and we're not allowing our children to be subversive. We're not allowing them to challenge and to question, to think outside the box. And that's what we need to bring about the change. Our young people need to be liberated, to set free, to challenge these dominant narratives, to identify the idols of the system and expose them for what they really are, which allows them to us to be controlled. And that control starts at a very, very young age. Um, so this is, this is one of the big things that we need to crack. Um, so I'm so glad you answered that question. Thank you. So I'll try and get through all those points. So yes, the, I agree with what you both said about the curriculum, but there are opportunities. We, at CND, we can't change the education system, but we can take the opportunities when they present themselves. For example, my sister-in-law is a religious education teacher, and she phoned me last week and said, oh, I can teach my kids either about animal welfare or nuclear weapons um, in the class. I, don't, I want to do nuclear weapons because of you, but I don't know how. Can you help? So I said, yes, of course, and I helped her. So CND's more general answer to this is our peace education program, where we produce um, in education resource packs for teachers to tell them and show them how to teach nuclear weapons to their students, um, depending on which subject they teach that through. Uh, we train teachers, we do teacher training sessions, and we also do what we call the school speaker network where um, we have volunteers, anyone in this room could volunteer today to do it. We give full training and we give you the tools to go into schools and start conversations with students about nuclear weapons that match the curriculum. So it's not something extra the teachers have to take off, it actually helps them as well. So this is a really valuable programme that goes some way to addressing the deficit in, as we see it in the current educational system. Uh, the cost of Trident, um, so CND is constantly trying to evaluate any change there. 
Um, our current figure is 205 billion. The vast majority of that is running costs through an estimated 40 year lifespan. So running costs would be anything from the staff that work on it um, to the maintenance required for the submarine. Um, the other big cost um, which Britain has just started paying out for now is building the submarines themselves. They are estimated to cost about £41 billion pounds, and the authorisation for this was given via a vote in Parliament in 2016 where a majority of MPs unfortunately uh, voted to start the work on the submarine. The next big cost will be the warheads themselves which is the nuclear bomb um, a vote on this is expected in the next five years. So that'll be the next stage where we can mobilise our MPs to vote against um, a financial decision on Trident. Does anyone order it? Um, so, yes, um, not officially, um, but the, um, there's a committee in Parliament um, that is very good at keeping an eye um, on how it's spent because MOD projects notoriously go over budgets. The average is they go a third over budgets on each project. So there are MPs and committees that are holding um, the project to account, but that doesn't stop the project from going ahead. These committees don't have the authority to stop the project. They can only ask the questions. Um, and then, yes, we'd be a hypocrite to tell any other country to get rid of its nuclear weapons without getting rid of them ourselves. But we as campaigners can reach out to campaigners in other countries. Um, there are international networks, of which C&D is part, where we can work with people in France, in Pakistan, or in countries that want to sign the Global Ban Treaty, like Australia at the moment, which is having a big debate about it. So, no, we can't maybe be hypocrites and say anything to the government, but we can work with other campaigners in those countries. Um, let me just focus on how can we persuade youngsters. And uh, I have no clear answer for this. And if we have, I think we have more youngsters here. But uh, what I'm thinking is that politicians, lecturers, students, parents, all of us have our own uh, ways to get involved, to change the society. So, um, what is important is, I think, uh, to think about, to create what I can do by myself. And I think the very basic uh, action is to talk to people about social issue, political issue, which sometimes we uh, want to try to avoid to talk about. Um, it is true that uh, not all the people are interested in this kind of political issues, but I'm quite sure that uh, some people, and um, sometimes not but few people, depending on what is happening in the big world, uh, not a few people are seriously thinking about uh, this kind of uh, issues. So, um, as long as you feel fine, I'd like you to talk uh, vigorously, positively, actively to uh, your friends and family members. Thank you. Thank you. We've got three minutes. Can I take another round? Or can I take another one? Who's got the most burning question in the room? <laughs> the most burning question. You stand up if you feel that yours is the most important. All <laughs> oh, right. I think. Um, we've had several information about the cost of uh, NATO and also the cost of uh, the nuclear weapons and uh, the effect on climate. In um, Al Gore's first film, he exposed that nuclear weapons, the amount of uh, climate um, the effect on just the, the um, environment. And I wondered, with this the new active climate prevent or whatever it's called, we should actually team up with them because we can show them how much money has been spent, mm -hmm. the effect on the environment, and that peace is very important to go forward. And I don't know why the army, well, it could be capital causing problems for the army, but young people are not being recruited to the army, probably because of all the wars that have been over the last 10 years. 
15 years. But also, I think the CND should look about how we could campaign and expose NATO, the cost of it, that every, every country in Europe that's joined the EU, nearly every one of them, has become members of NATO. And I was talking to a group of friends, not, not political, not nothing. One of them said, we were talking about questions being on the street of mental health, she said, we've not been to war for years. People do not believe, do not understand that we have been to war at least before 2000, you know, the first uh, Iraq war. So we've got a big problem about information and education. And a lot of people do not know the education before World II, which is part of the Ukraine, Ukraine and the Polish right wing. So we've got a lot of problems with education and the media, no media, no newspaper is going to support the, down, the, um, the effect on getting rid of nuclear weapons or armaments. No way, because they've got shares and they've got an interest in, in continuing this. Thank you. Uh, was well, I don't know if there's any reply. To yeah, that, that was more of a comment than a question, well, I, I feel. Yeah, I thought it was giving information, whether I'm right or wrong, or whether there's a bigger discussion. But looking at what um, a Japanese spent about going right across, looking for new ways of communicating. Uh, I'm sorry, we've run out of time. Uh, I think the speakers basically hopefully will hang around for a few minutes. So maybe you can come and uh, ask some of your questions after we've finished. Uh, thank you to all the speakers for, I feel inspired, I've got new energy, I've got some hope, I hope that everyone else does too. I'd end with a cheer, but I feel like this is the wrong crowd. <laughs> so thank you for coming today.